the first question was, can you give some specifics for the compost, such as the rate supplied, um, the total amount of nitrogen in P and K? Yeah, I could take that question. Um, we, we put, uh, basically we put um, 30, about 35 tons of compost to the acre, uh, quite a bit um, by normal standards. Um, our goal was to, we really wanted to make sure we were going to see a difference, um, but we also didn't want to bury the standing vegetation. These are perennial, per permanent rangelands. Um, as far as the nitrogen content, um, we had a carbon nitrogen ratio in the compost of about 11 to 1. Um, and as far as tons of nitrogen per acre applied, I'd have to, um, I'd have to send you that information. So that's maybe something we could provide. Um, in, in written form later. The next question was um, for Jeff or John. What do you see the largest barriers for producers to adopting these carbon farming practices? Well, I'm, I'm happy to jump in here. The, um, you know, clearly the cost of the practice is the uh, um, question. But it's important here to remember that this was a, uh, a thought exercise of, as to establish whether or not a management practice could, in fact, enhance soil carbon levels. And we didn't think that our research was going to be such a success. And now that it is, we're enjoying that question. What are the barriers to global adoption? Jeff, do you want to add into that? I think um, in cost, obviously. Um, but I think uh, what we're finding now as we, as we move in implementation at farm scale is, and we look across the state of California and ask the question, how are we going to do this at scale? Our model is to work through the resource conservation districts in collaboration with NRCS. But um, as, as we all know, all of those agencies are, are stressed for resources right now. And so it, I think it's a shortage of technical uh, transfer personnel that's going to turn out to be and a limiting factor for us, um, and, and then the finances to support that work. I think that's probably, those are the big, two biggest barriers. I'd, li I'd like to jump back in here, too. The, the shape of our project is um, our basic research has established proof of concept, and it worked. And then that then supported the additional activity of demonstrating this at scale, and, and um, that was actually supported with SIG grant funding and and foundation funding. So we were able then to get thousands of yards of compost out on uh, three ranches in Marin County. And we did that to identify the barriers and obstacles uh, preventing this from, from being adopted globally. And we're in process now. We were able to work with the Environmental Defense Fund, and they also got a different SIG grant to develop the protocol for this, which is in process with the American Carbon Registry currently and um, soon should be uh, submitted to the California Air Resources Board as an approved methodology to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions um, and therefore participate in carbon markets using our practice here. So just to review, the shape of it was a research project which then supported demonstration at scale, which would then uh, establish this is a, a globally adoptable practice. And um, it's pretty exciting. Yeah, thank you. Um, the next uh, question we had, which you kind of covered a little bit, but maybe talk a little more about, do you expect similar results um, using dairy manures rather than compost? Um, yeah, what, we, we actually looked at that, and we're, and we're continuing to do uh, comparative studies with manure and compost of, of varying qualities, uh, specifically varying carbon nitrogen ratios. Um, we definitely saw carbon sequestration occurring on manure plots, but when we look at the life cycle assessment that, uh, around that practice, what we see is that manure, because of the methane and nitrous oxide signature of manure, there's, there's a net greenhouse uh, uh, increase, I guess you'd say, from manure applications as compared with compost. So there's, the, the benefit of the compost is that we avoid a lot of the associated greenhouse gas emissions um, that, are, that result from manure applications and synthetic 
um, applications. That's not to say we don't we can't build soil carbon with manure applications. We certainly can, but there are other greenhouse gases associated with that practice that can be avoided if we if we aerobically compost that manure first. So just to clarify, in my mind, so um, using manure as a substrate for the compost, you're saying is a, is a better method rather than applying raw manure? Right, exactly. There, the manure itself, one, is often stored in anaerobic lagoons, which are fairly significant sources. In California, the major source of agricultural methane is, is from manure storage. If we, if we process that aerobically, through composting, we still get some trace methane emissions, but, but very little compared to anaerobic storage. Um, and then there's also a nitrous oxide signature from manure when it's applied to the soil that is much lower uh, with compost. In fact, the compost nitrous oxide tends to be associated more with the production of the compost, and it's a very small, uh, very small number relative to uh, the manure. So there are. Again, you know, yes, we can build soil carbon with manure, absolutely. Um, but but we put it in the life cycle context, there are a lot more benefits associated with aerobic composting and manure prior to application than just uh, trying to use manure straight. Great. Um, another question we had was, how do you balance the nitrogen and phosphorus over application with the benefits of carbon sequestration? That, that's a great question. Um, well, again, we're, by, by building a, a, a carbon-rich compost, um, the nitrogen and phosphorus tend to then be diluted relative to, say, an, uh, an equivalent quantity of manure. So um, we actually didn't see any uh, significant phosphorus signature from the compost. Um, there, there was a fairly high nitrogen content in the compost, but it's in, a, um, it's in an organic form. It is only slowly, only slowly made available over time in the soil. So we're seeing a lot less soluble nutrients in the compost than we're seeing in manure. Um, so I, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, thank you. Um, another question we had was, during the carbon life cycle analysis, was the carbon emitted from fossil fuel combustion that was used during the creation and application of the compost considered? Yes, yeah. It, we did a, the, Marcia Delange did a very thorough analysis and did look at the the greenhouse gases associated with compost manufacture and transport and compost application in the field. I'd like to add to um, basically the boundaries of that life cycle assessment, which is peer reviewed and published, included the collection of the materials, the composting, the transportation, the, the application, the enteric fermentation of the grazing animals, the background signature of soil system respiration, both in terms of CO2, methane, and nitrous oxide, or all three of those. And with all of that considered, the net benefit was so stunning um, that this is clearly a really good strategy. Great. Um, I'm going to wait and see. It looks like we have someone typing. Um, while you're waiting for that, um, one question that uh, we talked about a little bit that we haven't exactly addressed is where where do you see a lot of the substrate um, for the compost coming from? Good question. In California, we're currently um, disposing of about 30 million metric tons of organic waste materials in a way that is uh, greenhouse gas detrimental. We're either burying it in landfills or storing it in anaerobic lagoons. So we, we know that we have about 30 million metric tons of raw materials that we could be accessing if, um, or could potentially access if we were to turn our, our, uh, our efforts to, to doing that. And actually, that's where we came up with that 5% figure I used in, in my presentation, because that, that represents enough compost to apply to about 5% of California's rangelands on an ongoing annual basis. 